on the Zoom. I'm Tom Zinnan. Welcome to Plato Frontiers in Life Sciences. And I'm delighted that we were able to have our speaker today, Joao Gloria. Close yeah. enough? Yep, he's perfect. He trained me well. <laughs> uh, we usually ask people five questions. I'll ask you, where were you born? Where I was born? Mm -hmm. Brazil. And where'd you go to high school? I went to a college, uh, a school called Sistema back in, in Bahia. Yeah, in Bahia? In Bahia. Yeah. Okay. And then where'd you go for your undergrad and what did you study? I'm, uh, I went to agronomy. Uh, my BS is agronomy and was the Bahia State University back in Brazil. And where'd you go for your advanced degrees and what did you study? I got my PhD at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, right. Sao Paulo. And then when did you come to Wisconsin? I came to Madison two times um, back in 2013 as a visitor, a PhD student. And then I spent a year and came back. I came back again as a postdoc in 2015. Excellent. And then when did you start your uh, faculty position? 2009. Very you now. So he just got back from Europe. He was delayed by a day by his connection. So I hope he'll tell you about that. Um, I really appreciate a jet lag presenter because <laughs> right. the show yeah. is great. Now it's uh, about to be 8 p.m. So yeah, my body probably requesting 8 p.m. Yeah, I don't know about how Brazilians are, but when you're done, you'd be almost time for dinner if you're Argentinian. <laughs> right. Uh, would you please join me in welcoming our speaker? Thank you. Thank you very much. Should I speak here, Tom? Um, so this is the little, if you could, uh, whatever's good for you, but this is how they will see you. Okay. Can so stand here, so I don't even need that. That would be no, one point. Yeah. Okay, no problem. So thank you very much for having me here, and uh, let me share a little bit about what we do uh, related to artificial intelligence and this uh, kind of a hot topic right now in other areas. And we're trying to use some of these applications in livestock, and especially in dairy farms where I work mostly. So I will introduce uh, a little bit this topic and show why you should use, I try to convince you why this would be a good strategy to use in farms, how this can help us better monitor animals uh, to improve health, to improve welfare, and how this can also help uh, labor, uh, help with labor shortage, but also augment uh, the labor that we have available to perform activities uh, better, more efficient, and in a better condition. Okay, so... Um, we should leverage the AI development. So these artificial intelligence that are being developed by experts in the area in computer science and engineering, um, it's being utilized now more and more. And, and that could be uh, noticed through autonomous car. Uh, we are seeing a lot of push and development in this area. And there are a lot of tasks are being developed to, to uh, make this happen and things related to optimization, how we optimize these cars to perform well and don't crash, uh, sensing technology related to cameras and computer vision that are used to detect people, uh, streets, segment roads, and detect other objects uh, in order to, to make these autonomous uh, indeed. And then we have other sort of automations that happened in the past, uh, and we recently have these uh, techniques be implemented to understand consumers and how we select uh, our choice. And, and based on that, people will recommend us what we supposed to like, or maybe things that we don't even know that we like, uh, but that data being generated by us are being used, used to develop those intelligent systems. And on the uh, health um, side, we, we have seen uh, an advance in, for example, medical image analysis and how the analysis of these images can help clinicians and, and, and um, people in the health area to have a better diagnosis and, and better decisions. So the investment in this sector, it's growing a lot and areas related to computer science, engineering uh, are leveraging this investment. And as a consequence, we have, um, a lot of new algorithms and platforms for cloud computing and edge and sensors and more connectivity and different ways to connect people in 
multiple farms in rural, rural, uh, rural areas. So the point of this slide is to say that we should leverage all these development different fields. So a lot of those things we don't have to develop from scratch, from zero. Um, and so agriculture should leverage these to produce food in a more sustainable uh, way and profitable way. So that is uh, this growing area in agriculture called digital agriculture, precision agriculture, which is basically a leveraging the development uh, and advancing the field to monitor crops and livestock. And for that, we need to integrate different um, areas. And these areas involve computer science, involve engineering, involves production in agronomy so i'm not a computer scientist but the development of these areas are um, pushing us to use these given the possibilities and utilizations that we may have in agriculture and so we have sensors communication uh, of these sensors with the farm computers and with the whole internet connection uh, we have uavs the drones that are flying and taking picture of crops and animals uh, that generates a lot of data, and that's where uh, these um, machine learning algorithms are being implemented the most. And and but at the same time, we need to visualize well these data that the data that are generated and the decisions that are being are generated. So there are new platforms for data visualization that are very interactive. We can see that happening a lot. And then on top of this, the question that comes all the time is, what's the return on investment if I decide to buy this technology or that technology. If I had to fly drones and have a uh, management at my farm that is super precise, and I would spend money to do this, so what's the return on investment? And what's the economic benefit of that? And so all of these connected uh, give us this new field of precision ag. That is uh, also part of uh, strategy that we can leverage to make more sustainable production as well. Okay, so um, why do we need to leverage this? And, and I, I will now narrow that question more to the field that I work and the research. So that's actually the goal of this presentation today. So we are interested in data-driven solutions. Basically, you wanna go to a farm and you wanna, the dream would be the data is flowing from cows and from milking machines and from robots and everywhere. And these being integrated and magically give you an optimized decision. That is the dream, right? Um, to have that, although we need data, we need the data being collected. And farms are different from hospitals and shopping centers and, and this place because we don't have that level of automation to collect data for each single cow every single minute, right? So it's quite challenge, this component of generating the data and organizing data. Besides, the initiatives that we have in agriculture to integrate data for optimized decision can do very well integrating weather, crop, soil, price, water information. They can definitely do this and actually they are doing that. The limitation in our field, in our research is related to animal level information. If we wanna improve animal welfare, if we wanna improve animal health, if we wanna reduce uh, environmental impact related to those animals, we need to measure things at the animal level. And measuring things at the animal level is extremely difficult, as you may imagine. You have a farm with thousand cows or hundreds of cows, um, it will be extremely difficult to know, for example, the body composition of the cow, the gas emission of the cow, how much the cow weight, each individual cow every single day. So this is quite challenging. And that's the area we try to advance developing technology or adopting some of the technologies um, in farms. What is the final goal of aggregating this data. Let's say, let's assume we can measure things at the individual level uh, of, of these animals. Let's say, think about dairy cows. Our goal, the goal in our lab, uh, it's optimize farm management decisions to nutrition and health. So what the optimal diet can feed this cow? What's the diet that will minimize uh, gas emission? What's the diet um, that will minimize health and metabolic disorders, right? And we also, we also wanna use this data to improve labor efficiency. And um, add all that data that is being generated for management is also important for animal breeding program because there are people selecting animals uh, that has 
that have uh, greater genetics for specific traits, but you need the traits to be measured before sad selection. Okay. So today I will try to demonstrate all of these through three examples. One is using computer vision, how we can monitor animals using uh, cameras. The other one is using something called natural language processing that I, I assume some of you you know because sometimes you get your phone and just say something and the phone you translate the audio into text, right? So this is in our smartphones nowadays, but this may be very useful uh, for farm application, I'll show how. And that is this new area that my son is probably more familiar. That is mixed reality or virtual reality. You put those Oculus and then you play these video games, but there are some device that you can see the environment and also see a projection in the lens of the glass of some digital information, right? So if that people can work in a farm, but it still receive information through the lens of the glass. Okay. okay, so let's start with the computer vision first. So why are we interested in computer vision? Um, people sometimes argue uh, or question us about all the sensors that could do the same to monitor animals. One example is a accelerometer. In our phones, right, we have a lot of sensors here. And one of those sensors will generate a signal like that, that measure the motion, right? So how, how much you, you move. And based on that motion pattern, we will be used by models that will classify if you're running, walking, standing. We could do the same with cows. And actually the products that are developed for farms are based on this type of technology now. The problem is we cannot do much if we don't know if this signal is coming from what, which type of behavior. Right? So we need to know if this is grazing or non-grazing, for example, in order to do something useful, to use this signal and say, okay, whenever I have a new signal that looks like this, it's grazing. If I have something like this, it's non-grazing. And now I can compute total time spent grazing and non-grazing of that animal, okay? The reason I'm interested in, in image and cameras uh, is that the information we can capture in a segment of video, uh, it's huge uh, and is usually better uh, give us more, more data than we would have in this single signal here. So if we get this signal or this image, so this segment of video, you, you see that we can, without any annotation, only look in the video, we can know the cow is eating. We can see that the, green, uh, the grass is green. The cow will give a step. Uh, it's not, there you go, there is one step here, the, num the bytes per minute. So you can see much more in this segment of video that you can see here. And the same from the non-grazing activity. We can see much more than non-grazing. Here the cow is ruminating and you can see that. So as we think in the long term, we're gonna store information that in the future will be very relevant and important given the ability that we are uh, having now of processing these data. So we're gonna have more power processing power and more things we can do with this type of data. And so the power we have storing and collecting this information is greater than we would have here. Not saying that it's not important, but say if we need to concentrate resource in the case in our lab, now we're concentrating more in that area. And then this interest can go beyond uh, a specific question that we have. I wanna predict behavior, yes. But then if I have an image like that, I can count how many animal was the breed of this animal, uh, the trees, the weather, if I had cl clear skies or cloudy. So there is a lot here that we don't even need information, prior information, right? Okay, people in medicine are trying to do something like this, right? So they're trying to integrate information from us. And so what's the social interact, the genetics of the person, the history, uh, if they took, um, what the type of diet, if they took any medication, the, the image of medical image, and so, they're trying to do this um, to prevent uh, disease or uh, try to understand a behavior in certain regions. So not having the information about us, about a person, is the same for us you're not having information about a single animal. In the sense that without this animal lab information, this individual information, we cannot do much. You can have data from the farm, from the weather, from the economics, but if you don't have data at the individual animal, uh, you may not be able to do uh, this type of intervention. And so that being said, 
the use of technology is the only solution to collect this information. And this technology will vary from robots, uh, smartwatch, drones, microphones to collect sound, uh, cameras to collect image, genetic, genomics, wearable sensors, all of these are being used now for animal monitoring. Okay, so let me show you a, a concrete, um, some more a real example, okay? This is uh, our research farm um, that's in Arlington. We have 500 cows, about 500 cows there. And those are the exits of the milking parlor. So the cows will come here twice a day. They will be milked and then they will leave. And they will leave through this lane here, okay? So we have this camera here, one here and one here. And so we have two exits here and the other side we have other two. So we have four lanes. The cow will walk. And whenever the cow walk, we will acquire pictures of this cow automatically. So we don't stop the cows. We don't make, there is no intervention. And that's what the challenge uh, is. The way we collect this is uh, we have this thing called death image. So this little camera here, it costs about like $150, $120. was cheaper before COVID. Now they're expensive. I hope they can uh, come back cheaper again. But they are very simple cameras. Actually, these are similar cameras to the one that the kids play in the video games when they track people uh, in those games. So that's, that's a small camera. Um, and that camera can generate three images. One that's called death. The infrared is like the night vision type of image you have. And a color image, we, what we call, which we call RGB, similar to what we have in our phone. The death image, which is quite interesting, uh, is a result of the, the, the camera actually maps the distance from where the camera is located to all objects in the scene, right? So the pixel here is not related to the color exactly, but is is a value that tells you how close the object is from the camera, okay? So in this case here, is if this is very dark blue, it's very close to the camera. If it's light blue, almost like green, then it gets far from the camera. And this is called color map. So we can paint this image with whatever color you want, because what matters is that the pixel value measure the distance. It's the distance from the camera to all objects, okay? So that being said, I can use this to have a 3D view of the cow. I can project this in three dimension and see the shape of the cow. So this is small camera is super powerful and give us this. So what we did here, we have this camera and this camera is calculating the distance from where it's located to the floor all the time. It's calculated, every single second it's calculating. Whenever this distance change, we acquire sequence frames. And so the intuition is if the cow is walking, then the depth is different because now the, the camera is detecting an object here and then you acquire a sequence of frames. Okay, so what is the challenge here? The challenge is because the cows are walking and we don't stop the cows, it's a real application here. We get the image in a sequence that you're gonna have the cow side walking through and the cow you leave the scene, right? So if I acquire a hundred images, take a hundred pictures, I'm gonna have at some point in this hundred image, one image that that's good. I have the entire cow, that's what I'm interested. I don't, I don't want this image that is cropped. I don't want an image that there is no cow. I want a perfect image like that. And so here is that our uh, challenge because um, we're gonna have to do some pre-processing because it's expensive sending data from a farm that you won't use later like this one. So we train models uh, that will classify a bad, uh, from a bad to a good image and a good image. So if we classify a good image that is one image with this cow entire well position here, we move forward. If the image is bad, we delete, you don't even transfer that data. So if the image is good, then we have another model training that basically detect which pixel in this image is related to the cow body, okay? To do that, we train a model and teach the model to understand that this is, or to learn this pattern, that this is pixel related to the cow body. When this model is trained and it's well trained, then we'll perform very well and we'll classify what is pixel coming from a cow, what is pixel that is not from a cow. If we do this, then we create this thing called mask. And the mask will be used to remove the background that we are not interested because we are only interested in the cow body, right? So if we apply this mask to our original image like this, we're gonna now have this perfect cow segmented 
and no background, okay? And then the same is applied to an image like that, a death image, and then we have the shape of the cow with no background. After this, then we're ready to start processing this image, and this could be used, for example, for animal identification. I could identify this cow based on a black and white code color pattern here, right? So imagine this is like a barcode or QR code. So you read this, and based on that distribution of white and black, it's okay, this is a unique identifier. And this other deaf image could be used, for example, to assess the body condition score, which is used in farms. So if the cow is super fat, the score is five. If the cow is super skinny, the score is one, because we have the shape here with this deaf representation then we can classify the score. Or you can predict body volume, or you can predict body weight. You can do other things with this type of image, okay? So the process then is done, and we reduce a lot the data that we are not interested, and we, we start using the data that is already pre-processed and will give us what we need, okay? Okay. Maybe, maybe you're asking yourself, okay, He's telling me this, but what happens if the cows are all black, all brown, or right? So how are you gonna recognize cows based on that? And so this will happen with some other breeds, uh, dairy breeds as Jersey or beef breeds as Angus. And so one thing we're trying to do is trying to recognize animals based on the shape of the back. Okay, we have this top-down view image. I'm calling this top-down view image. And then you have this shape. Here. And the question is, is this like face, human face that you have like a biometrics and the distance from the eyes to the nose, you keep similar, you can gain weight, you can lose weight, but hopefully my, the distance from between my eyes will remain the same. Um, so if we have a biometric, uh, some sort of signature here, we should be able to recognize animals based on the surface of the body, right? And then we are using these here and, and understanding which type of 3D representation would give a better accuracy to classify the animals based on shape. And the, the result we found is that uh, it can actually give us very good classification without any color information, only based on the shape of the animal. Okay. The question that remains then is, okay, what if the animal is growing? What if the cow is losing weight? Then you change shape. And how changing shape, that changing shape will affect the identification of the animal. So this is a short-term trial, but what we did here, we collect image from the calves, calves that were growing for a total period, period of six weeks. And so we start collecting data uh, from week one and skip one week and try to identify the calves one week later, two weeks later, or three weeks later, and see how that change accuracy. And so what we found was that is keeping one week, two or three slightly decreased the performance of the, the detection or the classification, but not a lot, which means that uh, those animals still have biometric features in the body that remains and help us to classify them. What we don't know here is what is the long term? If I have an image from these animals week one of age, and then I come back two years later, still am uh, able to identify them. And that's what we are studying here because this will really help if possible in the farm management. And so this is the death image that I mentioned. And if you get an image of a calf like this and you rotate this image in the computer, you can see this point clouds represented here. So that's a top-down view image. That's kind of a rotated or lateral view of the same animals. So we can have, uh, we can project that, that, that body down, right? We have limitations for sure. So for example, I don't know what's the depth of the animal, so I cannot compute uh, you know, the, the, the body depth here. We assume that is a whole volume project down to the floor, right? Um, but it still uh, can predict very well, for example, body weight, and I'll show you. And other things we are interested in also, it's how the body shape change when cows are mobilizing fat or body reserve and how this can result in a disease, okay? Okay, let me show you one example about shape. What are we trying to do with shape? So sex semen is being used in dairy farms more and more. And this technology, it's allowing farms to 
replace the females that they need, the cows that, that become cows, and using uh, beef semen in the rest of the herd that they don't need to produce a female or a cow, okay? And so they are producing them animals for beef production. And these animals are being um, consumed as beef, right? But then the cut on the carcass traits of these animals are usually not very desired because they're coming from cows and not exactly from pure beef breeds. And so then the industry complains sometimes or a lot of times about the shape of the cuts because one ribeye may have a shape that it's oval and another ribeye may have a shape that is more circular. And so when they regulate the knife to cut the steaks uh, to sell to hotels, restaurants, and grocery stores, a ribeye may have different weight for the same uh, width or, or thickness that they cut the steak. And so the question is how we can evaluate the animal or the meat cuts and this go beyond uh, beef production, how we can evaluate the meat cut without harvesting the animal, slaughtering the animal, okay? Without causing this or uh, causing any stress or doing this. So in this study, what we did, we use this deaf image that I just introduced to you. And we are trying to learn how the shape, how the shape of the animal at the surface is associated with the carcass traits or the cuts uh, that the animal you produce later on. Okay, so I won't go into details uh, on the methodology, but basically what we did here, we trained the same model that I presented that I said, the model will try to identify the pixels that are from animal body. We trained similar here. So the, the, the model is trying to identify which pixels are related, are pixels from the calf body or the animal body here, okay? And as we train this segmenter to try to segment what animal body is, the model is learning about a lot of features related to animal shape, to animal body. And so what we are doing is, is using what the model is learning to segment the body to predict what the, the, the meat cut uh, will be, or what the circularity and, uh, and the area. So here, I know it's a, it's a crowd slider, but what I want to show you, that's the predicted and the observed ribeye area, and that's the circularity. So the predictions are very, very good, uh, assuming, uh, considering the difficult uh, of the task. And so this is using what the, the computer learned about the, the animal shape. And here in yellow, it's when we use it, features or variables as volume, area, body, body volume, body area, body length, that we understand the measurement. So we know what this is. And we may assume that an animal that are more circular or more roundy, we have some sort of uh, cut, meat cut trait. But what happened was when you use these called biometric features or features we know about the animal, it didn't predict well. And so the approach where we let the computer learn the features to segment the body end up being useful in terms of being associated with the meat cut traits. The question then is, okay, how can we do this in large scale? How can we do this you know, um, in multiple animals, in multiple pens? How can we monitor the growth development of these animals? And so we have uh, in another facility at Marshfield, 30 pens where we install uh, these white box, as you can see here, with a, a small computer that can manage this camera and we have 30 of those, 30 cameras. Here we have a camera and here's the computer. So we have for each box, one camera and we have 30 pens and 80 animals in each pen where we use this camera to monitor growth development. And so this is a project where we enter some monitoring growth development, monitoring the memory gland development, which I'm not talking here about today, but we are ultrasound in the memory gland and see how the gland is developing, how this is related to the potential to lactate at adult phase, because there are implications related to humans here, uh, because we can monitor these and control diets and control stress and control all of that, we can learn a lot. And this knowledge can be useful in the human side where we don't have, we don't have that same level of control. Um, and so some researchers use uh, cows as model for lactation studies. And at, at the end, we have the genomic information. So we know the genetics of each individual calf. 
So now we have the body growth development, the memory gland development, and the genetics. And the goal in this project is to integrate all of these uh, to assess how this animal will perform uh, in the future when this become a cow. And we are doing this in calves and, and heifers, so very young age. So at the farm, we have a server, we have a computer that manage each individual device at the pens and then coordinate all of these. And we generate a lot of data. We generate 20 terabytes of data here. And this is another constraint that we have because it's really hard to transfer these with the connectivity that we have in these uh, areas now. So that is improving, that's getting better. We have uh, seen a lot of uh, a push in all directions to bring connectivity to farms. And we believe that this in the future will, will be uh, mitigated. So because it is not yet, it's still a constraint and you need to transfer data, uh, we apply some modeling techniques to reduce the dimension of the data and try to, to show you this. So if we go in the literature and now a group as well are doing the same, we can get one image, this deaf image that I mentioned, we can segment the image and then we can have only the animal body and we can have this deaf, that's the, the, we can have the shape of this animal without the head, without the tail. And then we can compute the area, length, volume and use this to predict body weight. And the predictions of body weight are very good using these deaf images. So we can definitely, definitely monitor growth development because we can use the deaf image to predict the body size or the body weight of these animals. This can be done in cattle, in pigs, and other groups are doing these in the US and, and internationally as well. There are several groups working this body weight and growth development uh, type of prediction. But the question is, can I, should I send out, uh, do I need to send an image like this out every time I collect at the farm if I don't have connectivity? So what, what can I do in terms of reducing the dimension of the data and it should predict the body weight well? And with that question, what I try to do here, it's uh, this is the deaf, this is the animal body, it's segmented, there is no head, we remove this, so we have only the, the surface or the, of the, the back of the animal. So, if we imagine that this image is one matrix with a lot of numbers and actually this blue area is a bunch of zeros, the only numbers here are related to the animal height, right? Um, we acquire, instead of having this 2D image, we acquire one vector, one line of data in the horizontal dimension and one on the vertical dimension. And so if I concatenate these two lines, the horizontal and the vertical, I have this 1D signal, right? And you, see, you can see here, this kind of represents the animal. This looks like the back view. If you, if you see the animal from the back, you have this. And here's if you look at the animal from the side, imagine a line, right? And these are the heights that we extracted from these two lines. So like we concatenate these two. And now instead of have an image, a 2D image, I have one D vector with 936 data points on. Okay, okay. So the question now is, can I use this to predict body weight? Is that representative of the body shape and the size of the animal? Because if it is, then it's less, much, uh, less data that I need to transfer, okay? Okay, so I won't go into tell you how we analyze that, but I will tell you that we use a technique that can receive this signal and can reduce even more from 936 data points to 20, 20 variables, okay? And then our goal is to use these 20 variables to predict body weight. So we did that. And interestingly, if we look, these 20 features extracted from this signal were very well correlated, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively correlated with animal height, body height, body width, body volume, which means that the computer is extracting patterns in this one, this signal, very well correlated with uh, the animal body, okay? Which indicates it's possibly gonna work to predict body weight. So then if we look what we call biological features, which is uh, the volume, the area, everything measured in a 2D image, and we compare these with these autoencoded features, which are these 20 features. And this value here closer to one is the best. And the root mean square is there of prediction, 
in kilograms, they look very similar. They have a slightly difference here, but they overall are very similar when we apply this in a testing set. And so when we look at the reduction in size, this image here had about 600 kilobytes. And this 1D vector, I'm not even considering the 20 feet, only this 1D vector has 0.21 kilobytes. So the amount of data I have to transfer out of the farm, if I transfer this 1D signal, uh, is, is tremendous, uh, is tremendously reduced compared to using the 2D image. And so these, per se, it's already very effective to implement the systems in farms. And if we don't take this in consideration, then um, it will be very difficult. So we have an interest in other applications, uh, monitoring uh, the other of animals, um, behavior here, the death image, uh, the mouth tracking to understand how the animal is selecting feed and eating. Uh, the example I will show today of this type of device and the meat cut traits too. Okay, so let's see now how we can improve labor and labor efficiency using this natural language process. So one thing that happened at the farm and actually in, all, in several activities, we need to, for example, that if we want to detect pregnancy, the vet will go and examine this cow. And if this cow is pregnant, we'll write in a piece of paper, right? People work in the milking parlor, we'll see a cow that's sick, and do you write the information on a piece of paper? And then you type in the computer. So that's the regular process, right? Okay. The process with that, it's, we are not using our time very efficient to just type data into a program. And these also lead to lack of standardization. People will see mastitis and they you will probably write MSAT, we write mastitis, we write MST, we write MAT. And later for data analysis, these become a problem, especially when the data sets are millions of records, right? And then you can lose information because someone wrote a piece of paper and it's okay, uh, Tom is supposed to type this in the program and then Tom doesn't know that and then Tom doesn't type the program. And then, oh, but he's supposed to do this and then the information get, can get lost. Okay, so how can we improve that? Now uh, we have in our phones that ability to record, record notes and, and press a button and say something. And this can be translated to text. This is uh, being used more and more. This text that is translated is considered unstructured data. So we don't fit that in an Excel spreadsheet with columns and rows, right? So we have, this can come in different shapes and forms depending on how much you speak or, or you, you say to your phone. So then there are class of models that will receive this text and you classify the text uh, given the context of the words that that carries, okay? So, for example, if I say cow 32, 32 has mastitis, I could train a model that will classify if this is a health record or if this is a preg check. And based on mastitis or ketosis or acidosis or some keywords, we will have that classified. Okay. So then we can have this thing called intent. What's the intent of this text? And then um, we can get information out of that intent of that sentence from subjects and, and things that are here. So for example, in this cow 32, 32 has mastitis, we, have, we can define two entities, one is cow and the other is the health issue. So the cow will be this number, the health will be mastitis. So as we define those entities, now I can say that 32, 32 belongs to entity cow, mastitis belongs to entity health, and finally, with that defined, I can get this unstructured data and convert this into a structure that you could see in an Excel spreadsheet where you have column cow, column health, and then start filling these. So the whole idea here is that someone work in the farm say, cow 32, 32 is sick, and this will automatically populate a program or a file, uh, a database in a more structured way. So from text, you would have uh, a graph with the percentage of cows with that disease. Right. I'll go in details here in terms of how this performs, uh, how well it performs, but I want to show you that we added uh, a translation component. So if you have a Spanish speaker or Portuguese, or if I'm from Brazil, I speak Portuguese, and let's say I'm not able to read or write in English, or I cannot put information on the computer, I could just say in Portuguese, and this could be converted to English, and then the whole pipeline would happen the same way. 
So for Spanish speakers, uh, that would be very helpful in order to insert information in a very standardized way in any program at the farm, right? And lastly, um, we have this mixed reality and now I go is how to understand how the per people interact with animals and how we can help them uh, to get trained very fast. So we have this thing called third person view. So we have cameras monitoring things, fixed cameras here that are monitors, like someone else looking to us, right? But then there is something, but with this type of cameras, we don't know uh, this intersection. We don't know that interface between animal and human. So we can see what this guy is doing, but we don't know what he's seeing, right? And so what do we wanna do? It's leverage this equipment called mixed reality where people can see the, the, the physical world, but also we can plot in the lens information for them, okay? And the way this works now is you have to interact with your fingers and click and open screens, but at the farm is really hard. People are busy and they cannot look at cows and do these things. So what we wanna do here is put someone to use this and let the computer process all the information. Whenever something goes wrong, they would alert the person. Okay. So let me show you, this is um, a student uh, using the device at the milking parlor. So that's what they see with this device, right? So they have uh, a totally different um, interface compared to a camera that is fixed on the wall, okay? And so what do we wanna do here? It's, uh, for example, one of the things is tracking uh, the processing with related to hygiene. So pre-dipping, post-dipping, wiping the teeth and put, attaching the machine. We're gonna track all these steps in the way that if they forget something, we are able to plot in that lane and say, hey, you forgot this cow, you should clean that up. So it's some sort of real time um, solution for, for things that you may forget. But at the same time, this may be very useful uh, to train new employees uh, and train them quicker and augment human perception in the sense that they, they we remember, uh, it'll be, we remind them about things they may forget. Uh, and then we can track, for example, in these conditions, standard protocols, and better understand human animal interaction. Why some people, uh, we work with cows and they, the cows they work never get mastitis, never get infection. What they do specifically, the others are trying to do similarly and they just don't have the same, get the same result. So that type of uh, interface is not very well studied and we are interested in advancing that too. Lastly, um, uh, this is just a summary from things that we believe uh, in terms of digital technology, we believe that they'd be more and more important to collect animal level information. Um, animal level information is indeed a constraint uh, to advance several areas in agriculture and animal farming. And we need this and leverage the technology developed for that. Um, so undergrads and grad students and so outreach activities, uh, educating this new generation, uh, my kids, and they, they have um, good sense of technology. So they understand a lot of these things. So the question is how we can educate this new generation interest in agriculture uh, to work with technology. And at the same time, work with the ones interested in technology to work with agriculture. So we are working hard to create course and educate um, students in this new area. And it's very fun because a very multidisciplinary uh, type of work. So I interact with a lot of computer scientists and engineers in order to develop uh, these systems. Uh, I wanna just thank you, um, the support I have in my lab for different partners and especially these, these guys uh, that are part of the team and they, they help and they develop pretty much everything you saw here. And that actually is a UW Science Expedition um, this year. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I guess uh, that's what I'm going to show you. That picture represents some of the high achievements I've ever seen in science outreach. You got a live dairy cow calf in that discovery building. And it's, I don't want to underestimate the patience you must have had. <laughs> Get the okay to bring those in. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, I had a 
you, you said you weren't uh, like an AI expert, but I was just curious if you know what kind of model they use, like, like is there a multi-layer uh, um, perceptrons or is it like radio bias functions or what, do you, what kind of um, like general software models they use for the machine learning? Yeah. And um, I, I guess that would be- Yes, uh, no, excellent. I, I, it's used like, it's like Right, you all from yes. Okay. Yeah. Let, let me let me uh, go back to one slide here, and from that I can I can mention. But the excellent. Yes. Uh, the question was, uh, what type of models I use for these analyses? If I develop things from scratch, uh, what, what I leverage, what I develop, basically, and what type of things we use, right? Um, so there are uh, a two type of models or a true group of things we use it here. And we heavily use convolution neural networks. And we are using architectures already defined as this one exception. We use inception, other architecture for image classification. And we have other networks like UNET that are developed for image segmentation. And so we implement all of these in Python and we do our validation. We have our own data set. We retrain these. Sometimes we leverage these convolutional network that are pre-trained in more generic data sets. Sometimes this uh, doesn't work with us because those networks are trained in image with like boat and cat and dog. And then when we have specific uh, needs, it doesn't perform well. And in, then in this case, we try self-supervised learning. So we train the network to, for example, identify an image, a rotation in the image. So we label large data sets just to make sure to, to, to learn representation of the data that we have. And so we don't have this gap between what the weights of this network that were trained in a more generic data set and come to our data set. So we leverage a lot of convolutional network for the image process for image classification, object detection, uh, image segmentation, as you can see here. And then, um, and we implementing all of these uh, our own. And so here is, again, a lot of uh, convolutional networks, but for image segmentation. But at the end, we generate these feature maps, and we are using these feature maps for, for another prediction. And, and in this case, we're still using convolutional network, but we could use other analytical strategy. We have a lot of data here, and that's why we are using more deep learning and convolutional network. But for examples like this one, we are using uh, multiple linear regression, random forest, uh, lasso and ridge regression, um, because we don't have a lot of data to feed to those models in order to teach them or, or to um, for them to learn from our image. So we have small data sets, fewer images. So then we extract features that we understand, like body volume, body length. And then these variables are used in these models, uh, more robust in the sense of uh, overfeeding and, and avoiding um, the model copying the training set um, and then not performing well when we extrapolate these to other distribution or other type of data. Yeah, I noticed that your, your training sets are like between 10 and 15,000. Yeah. Are you, are you happy with that or would you like more? Or? Yeah, uh, well, that's a good question. I think it, it kind of uh, it depends on the application. Some applications, we capture enough variation in the data uh, and then few images train super, the task sometimes relatively simple. Uh, it trains very fast and, and, and sometimes it's just complicated, requires a lot of pre-processing. We don't have enough variation within image. And there is a lot of redundancy in the data set and then having 20,000 actually doesn't really help because they are pretty much the same thing. So I don't have a number for how, how many images or, and actually it's a question that people often ask like how many images uh, you need to train this well. And, and so, in traditional experiments, we have a hypothesis test or one investigator correlation. You can run uh, uh, a power analysis and define, okay, for that bunch of variation, if I have these X animals, am I able to pick these with how much confidence and so on? So with these, it's hard to know because you don't even know. With, you always, we often don't know the type of images that will come through, how much they will vary, how much redundancy you have in these data sets. And so um, how quick, or how much image we need in order to train these networks you know, to extract useful features that we classify well, whatever we want to predict. So I guess I'm more dark uh, zone in terms of how many images would I should I have. Um, 
And it's we can capture in the literature for similar tasks how many image people use it and, and how that perform it can indicate things to us. But a more formal test, it's uh, may not be as as trivial as in other uh, type of applications. Yeah, but uh, if if I'm happy with this, well, the question when we ask the students, uh, people talk about big data and large data sets, and people get excited about that. Uh, I guess my students they don't get very excited about that because. Whenever we have like million data set, million images or hundred of thousands of images, we need to parallelize and break a bunch of tasks. And, and, and so it's it's usually a lot of labor, I mean, a lot of work to get this analyzed. So we would rather go with small data sets, it would be much easier, I guess. Uh, but uh, and so the happiness will be relative to how much work they will have to put into this. Yes. How do you think like modern technology will how do you think it will affect? Farmers, especially a small nowadays farmers, and how that the result will affect the consumers. Yes. So you ask two points that are, we, we submit a grant today, and we aim to answer exactly these questions. One question is the willingness to pay from consumers. So uh, we're going to investigate if approved, if accepted or approved the grant, we will investigate uh, the willingness to pay for uh, products uh, coming from technologies that could be verifiable or you could set create certification around it. So if I have camera tracking cattle uh, and I can certify health, welfare, and a lot of things, would people pay for that? And how much would they pay? So these are questions that we don't know. That's why we're asking the grant. Um, and so unfortunately, I don't have maybe in four years, I, I'll have uh, more ideas. But but yes, but the question is exactly this. The industry is pushing. The consumers say, I, I know I want to make sure the, what this is coming from. But then the, the, the last question is, OK, OK, I can, I can tell you how good it is or and, but this will cost two dollars more in this gallon from you one dollar more so are you willing to pay and, and so how much i am okay if, if what is the five dollars instead of one so these are, are questions that we want to understand with all this technology development now and not only with um, food but all the products that are coming from technology that you have better quality or more certifications so are people interested in paying more and how much and and the question related to the farm size some of these technologies are, um, are relatively uh, cheap and they can be used uh, in devices like smartphones, right? And so pretty much everyone has one smartphone and they can take picture of a plant and detect the disease or they can speak something and save that. So I, I think uh, the potential we have in our hands now with this type of technology in terms of smartphones and, and I guess this you will allow small farmers or uh, to use a lot of things that are being developed. And, but also there is this question, uh, some technologies are not able to scale up easily. And so um, in this context, this may limit some people to use because if you scale that up, it may be more expensive to implement. But this is all new and, and this goes to this area of economics and evaluating willingness to pay, potential for adoption, uh, impact of scaling the technology up. And I think in, in agriculture, this is, is brand new. There is a group like my group that is interested in developing the technology, but now I'm interested in, in this grant. We are collaborating with someone in economics that, okay, uh, let's evaluate how much of this we want to become efficient, what, what it needs, what it takes to make this uh, economically feasible. And that in, includes farm size or um, um, farm background or um, potential to scale the technology up and so on. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I don't have a, a very clear answer to you. I, I do think that it can be used from small farm to large farms, but if how this specific technology will fit is something to be studied. And the second is willingness to pay, we don't know for this type of products yet. Uh, one, one problem that shows up in you know, some kinds of uh, artificial intelligence is you, you get a whole bunch of samples, say with like, like cows, they have all these images. And you say, okay, here's some red flags. These cows have red flags for early development of the disease. Right. But you don't know why. And it, it's right, but you don't know why. Have you run into this? Yes, and actually uh, the interpretability of these detection, these models is something we are interested in as well. So one example to illustrate what you're saying is we predict body condition score, right? Of these cows using the death cameras. So now let's say we have a thousand cows and we're going to train, you're going to use the death image and predict the disease directly. 
So we have the, and let's say that we classify the disease well, given the death image. We have the ability to go back to the models and see what the models put in more attention uh, on, the, on the death image in order to classify that disease well. So we may learn that uh, something is happening in the specific part of the body that we never thought about uh, because we're not able to see that time difference of, of body reserves changing. And so this can indicate uh, a little bit or teach us a little bit about the phenomenon that is happening, right? But I guess the, the, the other important question that you ask is, even if I have the right decision, the question is, what should I do? Because you have the red flags, but the question is, okay, this car gonna get sick, so, so what, right? So some uh, federal agents funding research in this area, they wanna see what they call closed loop. So they wanna actually have an experiment that basically say, okay, this model, if the model perform well, you're gonna have to test two or three hypotheses of intervention. So we close the loop. We say, okay, I predict the disease, and then I have a recommendation that will optimize something else. And so I guess usually it's a missing link. And I, I can tell my research, we have a lot of these because we are in the stage of advancing the phenotype of predicting or creating the alerts. But, but then whenever you come up with a solution, say, I can predict the disease now. So someone's going to ask, okay, what's the, what should I do then? And, the, and then there's always the next step we have that is, okay, now that I can detect disease early on, I know that disease will happen in 14 days. So what, what should we do? And it's tricky because if we ask vet, uh, veterinarians that usually treat cows, say, what would you do if you know that this is you come a month earlier? The cow is still, the cow is healthy. You know this cow will get sick in a month or in 15 days. What, what should I do? And several times we don't have an answer. I mean, sometimes the answer will be, okay, let's, you know, use electrolytes, electrolytes or some sort of uh, prebiotics or but that's not optimal. I mean, it's, it's, it's based on experience, but we don't have this optimization process on top of the detection, right? And th this is another very important area that as we advance the detection, so, so what? So what should I do with this now? Yeah. One of the earliest definitions of the Wisconsin idea had nothing to do with the university. It had to do with the uh, William Hort's idea that in Wisconsin, dairy farmers focus solely on dairy traits and not try to do combination of beef and dairy. And what, so when I saw your tweet about the ribeye in dairy, it was like, wow, this is going back 120, 130 yeah. years. Yeah. Um, is more information going to make it possible to increase the this com, coming together of dairy for better beef, or is it, is it not like I guess this is an excellent point. I mean, we have discussions about, well, is this coming back to like dual purpose or things like this? Yeah. But in reality, it's not the dual purpose, but it's um, producing beef from dairy animals. And this is growing a lot. Actually, that is actually, it's happening from, I don't know, last decade or so. Uh, if, we, if we look, the companies, the AI companies, not the artificial intelligence, the artificial yeah. intelligence, yeah. the yeah. amount of uh, a semen, beef semen that they are selling now, uh, they are selling more beef semen to dairy farms than they are selling to uh, a beef farm, basically. Wow. Yeah. And, and because the amount of animals that, we, the, the amount of farmers using sex semen, and so the amount of beef semen that they are putting on the bottom of the, the cows in terms of genetic, uh, uh, genetic, right? So it's it's a lot. So pretty much every farmer now, they, they have the sex semen, the females they replace, and the rest of the cows will come beef. And so they are using more and more and more. The point is, you don't see that because those animals, they don't stay here quite often. Where do they, go? they go to central plains. They go to Kansas, Oklahoma. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you have Holstein mom cows, uh, steers out in the plains now getting the raised yeah. and then. Yeah. Managed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So there is a this is a huge beef industry generated by dairy farms that I can tell you it's it's impressive. News to me. Yeah, and there are actually conference. There will be a conference in Texas. Um, a company is organizing a conference with people from, from uh, researchers from Texas A and M and the different institutions. Then the topic is beef on dairy, which that this thing is called, uh, given the economic importance that is having um, to the sector now. And then I had a question. When you've had beef by dairy, is um, 
he's the father and Jerry is the yes. father to the okay, so yeah. male. But, that, but that, that's been a cross-breeding has been going on for years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just not the volume of thought, I didn't realize it was this major industry where, wow. as he said, um, the, a, the artificial insemination companies are selling more yeah. human sex so that they're going to get... Um, so so for the beef, it's not sex. And that's why they're selling a lot. So... so, they, so the farmer, the dairy farmer is interested on, on the replacements, right? The females, dairy cows, they replace, uh, you become a new cow in the farm. So now that they, they can say, okay, this is my top genetics in the herd, and I want to inseminate these cows with a female semen, and it, right, and uh, I know that you'll be a female there, a sex semen, they go there. And then there is, I don't know, the rest of the, the cows that you can inseminate with uh, Angus semen, for example, right? Whether it's going to be, and it's not sex. And it's not sex. And then it can, could be a male or female, but but the, the, the calf will have a, a much higher value than if it's a pure hosting uh, male, for example. Okay. And then what do they do with these beef by dairy heifer calves that are born? They go out to feed yards. The beef on their males and females, they go to the feedlots. Yeah. And that doesn't happen here. We still don't have that kind of beef industry. We, we don't have a lot. I and mean, some farms they keep, and I visit some farms here uh, with 1,000, 2,000, 500 animals uh, for beef production. And they have, uh, sometimes they have all cross, like with angles. Um, sometimes they have host and, and, and cross mix it together. But if you compare it to the, other states, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's nothing, yeah.